And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. Welcome on this Tuesday uh, to Ask the Theologian. Glad you're here today with us as we come for biblical, theological, and worldview questions. And no doubt we'll have some fun doing uh, so as uh, it uh, is always a joy to uh, come together and to um, see what's on in the world. I've been working on evangelical garbage, why the church is confused, and uh, I can't even remember my own, uh, own title. Confused, something else, and downright dangerous. I've been working on the downright dangerous part. Getting almost done. I've got, I haven't decided if it's one chapter or three chapters left. I may put three things into one or I may separate them out. We'll see. Today's the day. I think I am going to come nigh unto finishing. My goal was to do it in a week. Okay, we'll call it a week and two days and uh, get that uh, done. Already part of it being edited, uh, because when you write fast, sometimes it's like speaking fast. You know, you just uh, get all uh, all mixed up on a few things. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about the book. Uh, and uh, let's see, yesterday I was writing about... Um, the, uh, the, the, the problem that evangelical has with the preparation for pastors. Uh, here's the uh, chapter right here. Evangelicalism is, oops, it jumped there, didn't it? Evangelicalism is not, uh, well, I'll just uh, bring it back here. Evangelicalism is not preparing your pastor. And I uh, write about how evangelicalism is just teaching the preacher to be a parrot. That's all they teach them to do. And so they go out and they're, they're parrots. And uh, churches are going to have a huge problem. In uh, Evangelical churches are going to have a huge problem in coming days in finding a pastor. Now, those who are in the right dividing community uh, may have a problem also. But I would say that in the right dividing community... Uh, they haven't been able to get pastors from the big box seminary forever. And so they've always had to kind of call up their own from within and train them in an apprenticeship kind of program. And so right dividing pastors tend to be uh, apprentice trained rather than big box seminary trained. So maybe we'll be a little better off, but uh, evangelicalism has a, uh, a, a huge dilemma out in front of them uh, in, uh, in, in that uh, regard. So if I could uh, get back here, I was going to give you a quote or two. Um, and um, uh, let's, let's, let's see here. Um, uh, let's go with a bankrupt position right here. Like a politician who doesn't really want to face the hard truth of his positions, evangelicalism is threatened by questions. Ah, this is a different chapter. This is the, there's the chapter on the pastors, and then there's a chapter on how evangelicalism does not want your brain. It does not want you to ask questions. And so uh, right here, threatened by questions. Like the politician, they want to appear that they are eager to hear from the people. But regardless the question, the evangelical will simply give the talking points. If people start asking questions about evangelical theology, evangelicalism will go bankrupt. It simply does not have enough biblical grounding and logical consistency to keep up the charade. When this is the case, don't take questions. It's because I've heard testimonies a thousand times from the evangelical ones faithful that I know this to be true. From the seminaries to the pulpits to the life group leaders, questions beyond the most simplistic, simply, we should put a comma there, shouldn't we? Questions beyond the most simplistic simply are not permitted. Well, we take your questions here. Sometimes even questions I can't answer. Sometimes even questions that make my theology uh, look bad. That's okay, because this is what we do. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the mantra now to follow the science. Well, don't follow the science. Question the science. That's the nature of science. Repeat the science. That's the nature of science. See if you can do it again. Well, when it comes to theological questions, it's okay if a question comes that says, huh, maybe, maybe this is a problem for our position. 
evangelicalism doesn't want all that. And so we will uh, uh, talk about, oh, talk about that too, but I got to go where I was, I was about done. And then Lorna comes up uh, from uh, Pittston, Pennsylvania and says uh, something that is also dear to my heart, if, if, you, if we can say it that way. And that is that doctors are trained parrots too. Uh, they are indoctrinators. <laughs> uh, doctors, indoctrinators, teachers, oh, it, 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 it's almost across the board. But I think that uh, it, it's, hard, it's hard, to, hard to determine which is more dangerous. One, the doctor, the medical field is more dangerous to you physically. The uh, spiritual field, the theological field is more dangerous to you uh, spiritually, obviously. So physical, the physical indoctrination, the, the, the spiritual indoctrination. And it is very difficult to find a doctor who will practice medicine, who will think outside the box. I have been listening to a book on germ theory uh, recently, and a lot of it has to do with vaccinations uh, because this is uh, uh, how germs are dealt with in uh, modern modern uh, medical science. And it is just absolutely eye-opening and frightening how little thought is put, question is put into it. Let's see, I, I think I heard yesterday uh, uh, that to take a six pound baby, a little infant baby, which they, they vaccinate uh, with all the stuff, the amount of stuff they put in that six pound baby would be the same as you and I, adult men and women, getting, what was it, 54 vaccinations? Do you remember the number? Uh, I think it's, I, I'm going to, I'm going to use that number. It's in that neighborhood. 54 vaccinations in a single day. Now, how many of you would go do that? Uh, Ms. Benner, it's time for your vaccinations. We've got 54 of them to give to you today. Anybody would say, no, wait a minute. You can't put those, set. what's in that? Mercury and aluminum and all this kind of stuff that the FDA says will kill you and you're going to stick it in my arm 54 times. It's the equivalent. The doctors don't ask questions anymore. And if they do, they get, uh, they, they get kicked off from the uh, union and, uh, and the union controls everything. Anyway, just uh, a, a, a sad state of affairs which does not speak well for our future in theology, in medicine, in politics, so many parrots out there. And the ones who do ask the questions get sidelined. Remember, uh, uh, wasn't it uh, Galileo who uh, said, hey, you know, maybe the, maybe the earth is not flat. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they kicked him out. I think there's, uh, I think that's, that that probably has been mischaracterized over the years, but nonetheless, uh, here we go. Well, we got time for your biblical, theological, and worldview questions today, and glad to take them. And uh, uh, Jeff says, "What's your uh, opinion of the Rotherham Bible? Rotherham Bible." My opinion is, I'm about to get an opinion. How's that? Uh, I have seen it. I have not used it. I am. Uh, I, I have uh, pulled it up on Wikipedia, so it's got to be true, right? Uh, and uh, let's take just a little bit of look. It's called the the emphasized Bible is what he called it uh, by uh, Joseph Bryant Rotherham. I tell you what. Before we even get into the Bible itself, let's pull up this Joseph Bryant. See who he is, Rotherham. Uh, a British biblical scholar, minister of the Churches of Christ. He was a prolific writer whose best known uh, work was the Emphasized Bible, a new translation that used emphatic inversion and a set of, dia uh, let's see, uh, di diacritical marks to bring out shades of meaning in the original text. Ah, so with that, uh, I want to bring up, I, I keep a bookmark, I'm going to get back to the question. We're going to uh, trace this for a moment. I want to bring up the Newberry Study Bible. Uh, it was done about the same time, 1898 here. Uh, let's, uh, let's see here. How do we make this uh, bigger? Um, we, um, we do something here, I'm sure, to make it uh, 
bigger. Well, let's just do it this way. Okay. Uh, in, in the Newberry study Bible, there, there really are some things I like. I have thought about trying to figure out how to reprint the Newberry study Bible because it does some of the things that the emphasized Bible might do and maybe wouldn't have uh, some Church of Christ suspicions in it. But let's, 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 get, let's get back to that for just a moment. The Newberry Study Bible here, I don't know if you can get it in print. Perhaps you can. Um, you notice like right here, where, where are we? Let's uh, get to the top of the page. Galat no, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 8. For though I should boast, it puts the little uh, underscore here in order to connect all of that to show that I should boast is uh, one word in the Greek. That can be helpful. It can be helpful because if the pronoun I was actually there, it's not in this case. Uh, but if it was there, that would tell us it's an emphasis. I, I should boast because the I, the personal pronoun there is embedded within the word itself. We don't have the ability to do that in English, but Greek certainly does. So there's some, some subtle insight you can gain through things like this. So uh, uh, let, let me jump up uh, here to verse uh, seven. Uh, if any man think to trust to himself, that he, that he is Christ, let him, you see all these uh, joined together, uh, let him of himself think again, that as he, notice the, um, um, the, the, the emphasis in the text here, as he is Christ, Bullinger provides this in his notes, but not in the biblical text. And this says, hey, this is an emphasized pronoun. This one didn't have to be there. And it really wants you to notice that, you know, he is Christ's. The emphasis is on him, not the fact that he's Christ, but he is Christ. Even so are we. So you, you pick that up a little bit. He and we are Christ. And it goes through. And so he, he gives some... Uh, some various things. Then there are, are like, like right there. I don't know if you can see that funny little symbol there. I would have to go again through the keys. There's these symbols, like there's the X, there's, you know, here at uh, Contemptible. There's a number of things that uh, are put in here. And uh, these are things that give the English reader some insight into the Greek uh, format. Now, you know that I use the Newberry interlinear. This is the same Thomas Newberry that uh, has uh, that that put this together back in 1898 and it tells me that in 1898 there were a lot of people who were really wanting to dig deeper and uh, make sure that you get the nuance of the original language in to the English translation it, it's based upon the King James I suppose the Rotherham Bible is too we're going to see in a moment based upon the King James but it uh, it, it has some some codes to help uh, help uh, things go it's not you know um, it's not something you're going to pick up and be able to use today it's something you'd have to educate yourself with now let's go back to James Rotherham uh, British scholar, member of the uh, Churches of Christ, prolific writer, best known for his Emphasis Bible. Okay, a new translation that used emphatic inversion and a set of diacritical marks to bring out shades of meaning in the original text. Looks to me to be kind of the same as the Newberry Study Bible. Now, he was Church of Christ. Uh, Church of Christ takes a very literal... Uh, reading of the Word of God. I like that. And the, the, where the Church of Christ, I think, fails is they do not rightly divide the Word of God. So, very literal, amen, uh, not rightly divided, oh me. Could any of that come through in his Bible? Maybe but if he's used the King James, probably not. Let's, uh, let's, let's go now and uh, see the actual article on Wikipedia for the Emphasized Bible. Um, 
a translation. Okay. His is a translation. Uh, I would, if I'm going to have diacritical marks, I'd rather have it in the current translation rather than his translation. So now I've got to deal with, here's one guy. Do I trust him? Well, it is Joseph Brian Rotherham, whom I had to look up to see who it is. I'm, I am kind of suspicious of one guy's work. Now, the Newberry Bible, yeah, you could say, okay, that's one guy's, uh, one guy's work, the Newberry Study Bible. But again, he's not doing a translation. He's just bringing to the surface some of the, uh, the underlying issues of the text. Let's, let's uh, keep reading. Okay, so it's a translation of the Bible, which uses various methods such as emphatic idiom and special diacritical marks to bring out nuances in the uh, underlying Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic text. Rotherham was a Bible scholar, minister of the Churches of Christ, who described his goal as placing the reader of the present time in as good a position that occupied uh, the, as that occupied by the reader of the first century for understanding apostolic writings. Uh, the New Testament, critically emphasized, was first published in 1872. Great changes occurred in textual criticism during the second half of the 19th century, culminating in Westcott and Hort's Greek text. This led Rotherham to revise his New Testament twice, 1878-1897, to stay abreast of scholarly developments. That I don't like. Uh, this basically says that he... He has gone with the critical text, the Westcott and Hort text, or now it's the Nestle Elan version number 28 because the first 27 were wrong. And so he, he's doing this revision thing. I don't like that. That, let me say that even Bollinger is more friendly to the text than I like. And he, that's the way he refers it, the texts say. And he's referring to Westcott and Hort and all the other texts that are out there. He tips his hat more to it than I would. I, I, I think it. Uh, I, I think we had a good text before that, and that uh, Westcott and Hort came and and um, uh, knowingly diluted the understanding of the scripture. These guys back in that early day maybe didn't know exactly what was at root there, and so they weren't as uh, suspicious of it as they should have been. Let's keep going a little bit. The entire Bible with the Old Testament appeared in 1902. Rotherham uh, based his Old Testament translation on Dr. Ginsburg's comprehensive Masoretico critical edition of the Hebrew Bible, which anticipated readings now widely accepted. I'm not sure what that last statement means, but this Ginsburg uh, uh, edition of the Hebrew Bible, very good. Uh, Rotherham's translation has stayed in print over the years because of the wealth of information it presents. Uh, some guy says that his preface in the preface to the 94 edition, the Emphasized Bible is one of the most innovative and thoroughly researched translations ever done by a single individual. Its presentation and emphasis and grammatical features of the original language still reward uh, careful study. I would suspect uh, that... It's presentation of emphasis and grammatical features of the original languages still reward careful study. I would suspect that there's a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit in, in it. Uh, and uh, with that, I wanted to see if I could find an interior page. I tell you what, uh, let's um, let's go to the same source as the Newberry Bible and see if there is a. Um, I I I kind of like this Internet Archive. It finds old Bibles. Uh, I mean, excuse me, old books. Um, and let's just see if it'll. Uh, bring up. It's uh, thinking slowly here. We'll move to a move to a commercial and then we'll be right back. <laughs> Let's see. I hear it uh, comes up. Okay. The, uh, I bet let's, let's try this first one right here. Uh, the emphasized Bible. Is this the same guy? Um, 
well, this looks like 19, okay, here we're going to open up a few pages here and see this Internet Archive is uh, scanned books of the Bible. So, Rotherham, yes, this is it. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's pick up, okay, we've got a limited uh, preview, and I can't get the page I want there. I want to see a page. I don't want to see the table of contents. I want to see a page of the scripture. Uh, let's try one more here. No, that's a different one. Uh, the New Testament emphasized, I thought maybe would be an earlier edition uh, there. Uh, okay, yeah, unfortunately, I am not able uh, to find a, a page from the inside um, to uh, take a look at that. But uh, again, I, I, my looking at that, I would say, yeah, it's going to have a few... Uh, it's going to have a few uh, challenges and issues, but probably some good stuff in there. Newberry Bible, too, which you can get at internetarchive.com. Uh, internetarchive. I think it's just archive.org. Archive.org. A great site for all sorts of old books there. Um, just so I don't miss it later, I see right here, uh, Jim Reeves says, uh, for those like me with reading disabilities, Logos has Alexander Scurby King James Version Audio Bible on sale for $10.79. That's a pretty good deal right there. Um, I, I like an audio Bible uh, on a number of different accounts. It's uh, It can be kind of nice just to have playing while you're washing dishes, something like that. Uh, carrying out a little, uh, you know, the, some of uh, those kind of things and uh, really um, can be a, a blessing. Um, or if you're studying, if you've got one that'll allow you to uh, follow, you know, find an exact text, the old cassettes didn't do that very well. But if you can actually go right to the text and uh, help keep your attention as you follow along in the text, help get some pronunciation. Alexander Scurvy did an excellent job on that. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's go to Jerry down in Georgia. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Jerry, you can. Can I get my two points back for watching on Worshipify today? Yes, you can, Jerry. Uh, he, he lost a couple of points. Uh, was it yesterday for not being on Worshipify? And uh, you know, I just I just glanced over real quick. Let me see here. I uh, I see that uh, Manny is in San Antonio, and um, it looks like Manny is on uh, YouTube today, and that's why his question hasn't been answered yet. He's he's gonna have to wait, you know. Be because oh oh I'm, I take that back he's he's watching on our website excuse me Manny I'll get to your question that <laughs> it uh, pops up in a different uh, chat thing Nathan's still working on getting all those uh, chats uh, coming out in the same place uh, now uh, so thanks for being on uh, on uh, Worshipify today Jerry now so I give you your two points back and did you check Roku. Uh, so, so Roku now does have the Worshipify channel. However, we had to uh, put everything in order for them to approve it. It can't keep updating. So this was back in December when we put some things on there so that they could approve it and take a look. Now they have approved it. So you can go to Roku. You can look up Worshipify. You can watch it on your, uh, you know, 97 inch TV. Uh, but if you go here in the next few days, it has not been updated. So uh, you're not going to get the latest stuff on there. That will uh, work to be updated, and I suppose it'll be updated automatically eventually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we'll uh, carry all that out. So uh, there's, a, there's a good word for you. In addition to your two points, uh, you can uh, now, those of you can find Worshipify on Roku. Excited about that. Um, 
And uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Jerry. And a uh, little comment from Debbie. Uh, the medical system has been totally exposed for all the harm they have done. I've learned so many things through this pandemic. It has been one of the good things about the pandemic is some of us, not enough, but some of us have started questioning the assumptions, even in things like the medical world, where we once just kind of uh, took uh, took um, a thought uh, of it and I, uh, uh, you know, we just, we just, we just went with it. Uh, and, and, and I agree, uh, with, with Jerry then, who says, although the most healthcare professionals have good motives, the system itself has always had a corrupt element. The, uh, allopathic, did I get that? Allopathic model itself has done untold harms, uh, to many. Now, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with allopathic. That would be, uh, uh, an, uh, a, uh, a pathogenic, uh, another pathogenic method, uh, the model that they use. I agree that within, within the medical world, I started to say medical science, but I don't know that that uh, would be the right term there. Within the medical world, they have adopted one single model and rejected all other models. And I think their model might be wrong. I'm no doctor, but I can read a book. And, you know, you read a book and you wonder, okay, well, what's the other side? I'd like to, I'd like to hear, you know, something. And I'm, so I'm in the process of learning and researching all that. But there have always been those who took a different model uh, chiropractic, chi chiropractic medicine, for example, takes a different model of sickness and healing, uh, acupuncture, uh, uh, you know, you can, wherever you want to go, Eastern Chinese mysticism, whatever, you can get, uh, all sorts of different models out there. And I think through all this, we ought to uh, say, Hey, uh, you know, let's, let's consider what are some of these other models, natural, nat naturopathy, uh, uh, these, uh, various things that are out there. Take a look at uh, at that. Now, I do think that. Let me just say, the, the medical, the medical, the the standard medical world. You know, if you need your appendix out, that's that's the place to go. Uh, if uh, if if you uh, need a heart bypass surgery, that's probably the place to go. If you you're sneezing and having a fever. I don't know that I would go there. It's it's the it's the germ area that I would most be concerned about, um, and uh, carrying that out in a in a different uh, way. But uh, as Jerry says, uh, uh, ignorance in matters on health. Boy, there is a lot of uh, those uh, those issues out there. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, Deb in the Ozarks. Uh, when pastors say that the church is uh, is what withholdeth in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse six, are they really saying that because the Holy Spirit is in us? It's ob it obviously can't be the church because the church is feminine and withholdeth is neuter, right? Ah, you must have been using the uh, I don't know the the uh, uh, Newberry uh, Bible or the. Um, uh, what's the one, the enhanced Bible, something that would tell you neuter versus feminine versus masculine. These things can be very, very helpful uh, to uh, look at. Now, let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. And uh, it speaks about uh, the, uh, the withholding, that which holds the Antichrist back. And you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. He is this Antichrist, that the Antichrist might be revealed. You know what withholdeth. Now, the what is a thing. And when you uh, look at uh, this particular thing here, now I don't have the underscoring, but if you uh, uh, put up the, uh, uh, the, the mouse on it, it highlights both of those to tell you, okay, all well, that's one there. What withholdeth is one. And it is in the, uh, in the neuter. Uh, it's got a definite article, the thing that withholdeth, that which withholdeth, what withholdeth is uh, all in there. The, you, I think you could say the withholder, uh, but, but it's got to be in the neuter. Now, 
many, many times the answer is it's the church. The church is that which withholdeth. This goes along with the idea of a pre-tribulational rapture and the Antichrist is revealed after the rapture. And so the assumption comes in then, well, the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as Deb says, and I think this is their thinking, the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit and the church marching onward and it's... uh, uh, can you use the word crusade today? Marching onward and its crusade for the betterment of society. The church is holding back evil, even holding back the Antichrist. Now, uh, that, I, it, I don't think it works grammatically because I think ecclesia is uh, feminine always. Let's just double check that. Let, let's come back and double check that in a moment. Uh, but I think it also has some other logical issues with it. So the church is withholding the Antichrist. The church is holding, he, the church has got the Antichrist changed, chained up. That almost implies that the Antichrist is alive and on the earth and has been all through the ages. It also implies that the Catholic Church in the days of, uh, say, the Dark Ages, when the Catholic Church, for all practical purposes, was about the only church there was. Um, Now, in the Grace History Project that we're working on uh, to get into print, I think we'll see, yeah, there's been always a strain. The Baptists always said that, you know, the the, uh, scarlet uh, thread of redemption, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the... what do they call it? The blood, blood stain trail. I've forgotten the terminology there. Uh, there's always been that little pocket, but you know, did that little unknown pocket really hold back the Antichrist? It, it, the the idea that the church is holding back implies some strength of the church that I think has often not been there. And it implies that the Antichrist was alive and he would have taken over had the church been removed. Uh, There's the possibility that the Antichrist has been alive the whole time as a human. I know that gets a little weird and and I probably don't go there, but... But you could develop a decent argument for it, especially if you want to say it's Judas. I think that the problem here is just not thinking broadly enough. And this is, this is what do they call it, a false dichotomy? But maybe here it's a false trichotomy or something where they come up with two or three options and then they just begin to focus on the options. And it's kind of like, you know, someone uh, saying to you, I don't know, do you want, um, you want hamburgers or you want Mexican food for lunch? And, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you just say, okay, I'll have, uh, I'll have uh, hamburgers. And you don't say Chinese, Italian, or how about fried chicken livers down at the uh, I forgot the name, Jim. The Lizard's Gulch or something like that. The Green Lizard, uh, uh, that restaurant we were looking at back a few months ago. I've still been wanting to go. And now I can't even remember the name. But it has something to do with a lizard. Uh, you know, we once you set a couple of options there, our mind just says, okay, let's focus on those two options. Well, it's it's the Holy Spirit that holds back. It's the church that holds back. And they, don't, they just don't keep thinking and making the list. And I think that uh, there is a thing that now withholdeth. Why not that thing being the abyss? It's the abyss, the place where he is withheld. And you know what withholdeth now that he might be revealed in his time. You know, maybe when the abyss is opened up, for example, in the fifth seal, then foo, he's uh, he's free and runs. Or uh, at the uh, first seal, wherever you want to take that, there's a number of places that uh, you could uh, have the abyss release him. 
I think that makes so much better sense. So there's, a, there's that logical problem with the church in addition to the grammatical problem with the church. And uh, let's, uh, let's just uh, find a church here. Uh, I just randomly picked this one in First uh, uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Let's take the word. I'm going to do a little search here. Uh, now, this is only looking in the feminine. Let's remove the feminine and let's put the neuter. And let's see. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm. Ecclesia can't be in the neuter. There is no such thing. So, so it's a grammatical problem, which, which should just put it out of thinking altogether. It's not the church. Uh, it, it could be spirit because the spirit is in the neuter. Uh, so that one's a possibility. But I think that um, when it uh, all, comes, uh, all comes out in the wash, it's not the Holy Spirit that withholds them either. It's this thing of, I think, the abyss. I uh, write a little bit about that in uh, our uh, book, The Antichrist is Alive But Not Well. It's a little booklet, and uh, I don't know, 2 or $4 on dispensationalpublishing.com. Uh, or some of you like, you know, Lenny and Elizabeth, I see we got th them here with their picture on Worshify even in London. Uh, don't buy it because it's so expensive. You know, just just talk to your friend and uh, we'll... we'll uh, uh, find a way to uh, send you a different kind of version. Hey, speaking of different kinds of versions, uh, uh, yesterday we we uh, uploaded uh, the Silence of God in Kindle format. This is our revised version, and uh, I don't know if it's up yet because it takes up to seventy two hours. Um, but um, in that, um, in our version of it, um, we've got, I'm trying to find our version of it uh, real quick here. Um, and um, anyway, soon on uh, Amazon, you will have, um, okay, I'm going to have to look for that later. Soon the, the uh, Kindle version will be up, if it's not already up. Thanks. Uh, appreciate, um, appreciate that. So, yeah, I think you're right, Deb. I, I, um, I agree with you. Um, that's interesting. Grace Mann there says, I heard the other day, the third leading cause of death is malpractice from doctors. And I suppose the first two are what? Cancer and heart disease? And especially with cancer, I suspect that much of the cancer today is caused from the, um, the theory that medical science has taken and that doctors, uh, I, I guess I should say the medical world poisoned us a long time ago. And that is the chickens now coming home to roost because the prevalence of cancer, uh, childhood cancers, adult cancers has skyrocketed, let's say since the 1950s Maybe you could argue, well, it just wasn't diagnosed as much. I, I kind of doubt it, really, but uh, but maybe you could di you you could uh, argue that. But uh, cancer, say from the 1950s onward, has grown and grown and grown, and I think much of it may be we're injecting a lot of stuff into our directly into our veins. And the veins don't have a digestive system and the ability to really to, to shed that stuff. And so something happens uh, in the body. And uh, who knows what the long-term effect is of uh, the current uh, 
jab, 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 jab. Um, who knows? I don't know. Um, Rudy in Belgium. Good to see you today. And uh, our uh, question uh, from Rudy has to do with uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is this for the body of Christ? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye always have, not also in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The word uh, work, uh, cat, cat airs, um, I, be, I believe it uh, comes from the ergo, uh, yeah, ergon, I want just to make sure, uh, cat ergon, the, the ultimate kind of everything that you can do with it. Uh, work it out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to pleasure and to do, for, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now, is this for the body of Christ? I think the, um, the, the body of, uh, the, 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 the question here has to do with rightly dividing the word of Paul. And, Coming in the book of Philippians, unfortunately, you have picked one, which I have not yet gone through, seeking to rightly divide it in our blue letter edition. I do plan, my main focus is to get these Pauline epistles done, and so to uh, to go through the book of Philippians and to do all this. Now, if let, let's, let's see if we can follow here the ye, I, I think we're going to be talking about ye Philippians, but let's go to uh, Philippians chapter one and see if we can put any sense to who we, us, you are. I think this will help us. And let's just come to, um, to the beginning here. So to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, who of course are not saints, uh, We would want to camp out there a little bit. Uh, we would... <laughs> I shouldn't read comments while I'm talking because I see Debs talking about Vernon J. Vernon McGee and his country accent that is annoying. And Deb is in the Ozarks. Isn't this, isn't this rich? Deb in the Ozarks. Throwing J. Vernon McGee under the bus <laughs> because of his uh, country accent. He did have a country accent. Well, well, folks, today in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, it says to all the saints, and now we want to determine the identity of the saints. <laughs> I don't even know if that sounds like J. Vernon McGee. It sounds like the, the uh, I don't listen to him on a regular basis, but uh, he, he did have a strong country accent. Now let's, let's get back and let's talk about the saints. So <laughs> to Rudy's question in Belgium, um, uh, to all the saints, I, I think this is saints in Christ Jesus. These are believing Jews. I'll call them, we'll go with the little flock here. That's a term that, uh, that, that, uh, is probably as good as any in trying to uh, determine that. So to all of the little flock, now what does he mean with bishops and deacons? Uh, the, I'm looking in the Greek here, uh, soon, together with, normally is, uh, is uh, but, but soon is, uh, yeah, soon, sin, sign, put these things together. Uh, the overseers and uh, the uh, those who serve the uh, diaconos, the bishops and deacons, is a pretty good way to to uh, put that. You could you could take that as an emphasis, all you saints, along with your bishops and deacons, or you could take it it as an add on. Saints, and let me include in that also some non saints who are bishops and deacons. That is going to determine what we're going to do with uh, the, uh, the, the passage in uh, Philippians. 
uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation. Because we're trying to figure out who you are. Is you us? Now, if we take the point of view that the bishops and the deacons of verse 1 are included in the saints, he just wants to highlight them, then somewhere we would have to find between chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verse 12, we would have to find where you broadens that into the body of Christ. Because I do not take the position that the saints are the body of Christ. Now, again, I'm rare in this uh, matter, and my friends disagree with me on this, uh, but uh, they're, they're uh, somewhat wrong. Now, <laughs> so then he comes, grace to you, and peace, and the you there, the second person plural, becomes defined as the saints with bishops and deacons. Now, I'm not a saint. I happen to be a bishop, I guess you could call it, in the King James usage there, uh, an episkopos, an overseer. Uh, you may be a bishop or a, a diakonos, a servant. I think it's going to hinge on how broadly we take bishops and deacons. If we take them only to be the bishops and deacons of the saints, which I think you could give a real strong argument, then you is not, not Randy and Rudy. Uh, you is saints and their bishops and deacons, which means it would have a very Jewish flavor to it. Let's, let's play with it a little bit. I thank God upon every remembrance of you, saints, bishops, and deacons. I pray for you, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. Uh, it depends here on what he means by first day to understand what he means by gospel. This could be the gospel of the kingdom. You fellowshiped with it from the day uh, you know, John the Baptist came until now. Or it could be the Pauline gospel that, because... Uh, I do believe in that uh, period of the overlap as well. So, so, you know, which one is it? We'd have to do some interpretation there. Verse 6, being confident of this the very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, you know, I think I probably, if I were doing this right now, I'd keep this in black letters because uh, he started a work in you that he is going to perform until the day of Christ Jesus, that is until the day of the Lord. Well, we're going to be raptured out of here f long before the day of the Lord. Looks to me like he's talking about uh, the little flock here. Even as it is uh, meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Well, he did have the Jewish people in his heart uh, and the little flock. Um, and... Um, you know, ye are all partakers of my grace. Let's back up here. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my, of my grace. You could argue again, this becomes Pauline, but in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, strangely enough, the only defense and confirmation of the gospel we have in the scriptures is when Paul stood charged by Jews of handling the gospel of the kingdom wrong. And he was innocent of that. It was false accusation. Again, a Jewish thing. Um, so we might find that Philippians is far more Jewish than we ever expected it to be. Uh, and... You know, let's even let's just jump down a little bit. I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Again, could this be the the kingdom gospel that they were to spread throughout, uh, you know, to the remotest parts of the world? So that in my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the uh, in the palace and other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, I probably would take that to be Jewish also. Waxing confident in my bonds, uh, much more bold. Uh, and, uh, you know, Christ certainly was part of that uh, kingdom gospel. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, Rudy, and it's going to take more study to do it, but I think that I am going to have to uh, lean towards this is not for the body of Christ. 
allow me the opportunity to get to Philippians and carry that out, but I would, I would play with it with that assumption. It kind of makes more sense because we are complete in Christ. There's not this kata ergon that we have to do until the day of the, of the Lord. Um, a little bit different, uh, different kind of things. I, I think that, um, that I would uh, check that out. Uh, by the way, for those uh, in the uh, North South Carolina uh, uh, area, it's the lizard's thicket. The lizard's thicket. Got it. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to Sarah G up in rural Illinois. I listened to your evangelical garbage session. Thanks. That was last Thursday night. Uh, I was brought up in a fundamental Baptist, King James Version only, church, cult, Hiles. And they got an A-plus in manipulation, heart stealing, growth movement, and financial pressure. Was this because Hiles came out of Dallas Theological Seminary? Uh, you know, that it is a little, uh, a little bit different path than the 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 standard evangelical garbage that I was speaking of uh, uh, on Thursday night and writing of in the book, because Hiles, of course, does come from a, 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 a an independent fundamentalist Baptist King James Version only uh, uh, avenue. Now that group also does have, and I think is getting better at it, uh, but it does have the, uh, what are the words here? Manipulation, heart stealing, growth movement, financial pressure, a lot of the same characteristics. Was it because Hiles came out of Dallas Theological Seminary? Um, probably not. Uh, I, I think that this is one of those areas in which the evangelical mode uh, spilled into independent fundamentalism, or maybe this is just a thing of the, the, the human heart, which is deceptively wicked. And some of this is, is not unique to evangelicalism. I'm just writing about it within evangelicalism, but certainly you have manipulation within the independent fundamentalist movement. Uh, you have a manipulation that in the independent fundamentalist comes from a lot of legalism, whereas in evangelicalism, it comes from uh, a, a, a spiritual pressure that's put upon you. In the independent fundamentalist, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, not, not dividing the dispensations and so coming upon it uh, from that uh, strong point. Now, let me go ahead and say, if... If all I had to choose from was, was evangelical mystical manipulation or independent fundamentalism uh, legalist manipulation, that's a false dichotomy. But if all I had to choose from, I would have gone with Hiles rather than with, um, uh, I don't know, let's say Joel Osteen. Um, and, and that's... Uh, I'm not even sure why I go there because you don't have to. It is a false dichotomy. Dichotomy. You don't have to go there. But there was, and, and probably is, I'm sure, within the fundamentalist uh, Baptist movement, there, there's some cult-like stuff that goes on uh, because there is such a strength and a power and a touch not God's anointed that comes very strongly in all of that. Uh, so... Um, but I don't know that I would trace it out of Dallas Theological, I think, because there's a lot of guys that had that same idea and concept and were not out of Dallas Theological Seminary. So, so I think it, uh, probably, um, carries out, uh, I, I think the path does not go back to DTS, though... DTS certainly would uh, propagate some of the path there. Um, uh, let's see. Reading some of your uh, nice comments here about uh, 
everyone. Um, uh, <laughs> Brian down in Alabama. He says Jay Vernon McGee just had a nice Texas accent. He says, you leave the uh, city limits of Rocket City, which is Huntsville area. You run into some strong accents. Strong country accents. You're exactly right. Uh, And um, uh, y'all didn't get to hear Brian's accent because... uh, uh, we missed his greeting. He sent in a Christmas Eve greeting. And if I could get to it quickly right now, I would show it to you. You can tell he's from Alabama. Let's just say that. <laughs> but uh, but his is kind of mild. Yeah, you're right. Some some of those country places out there, yeah, you just... Uh, um, you have to have an interpreter. <laughs> um. Chuck in Weatherford, which is the best route to take when beginning to start audiobooks? Should I buy a Kindle or is there an app to allow listening uh, uh, with the phone? Yeah, I have started doing audiobooks. Uh, I don't know what the uh, what the other formats are. That I use Audible, and Audible is an Amazon company, and I don't really uh, necessarily uh, like that. Uh, but uh, audible.com and and then it's it's an app and you just listen on your phone and you uh, pull up your your uh, library and uh, uh, you know listen on your computer or I almost always uh, listen uh, on on my phone uh, through that and uh, yeah here's the one I'm listening to right now goodbye germ theory ending a century of m- a medical fraud. Boy, it's eye-opening. Uh, I think I'm going to order some some of the hard copy books for um, for our use in uh, dispensational publishing because it it really is good. I'll just sell them to you at, at cost. Those of you who like to read the page, uh, but yeah, I've listened to John Quincy Adams and Patrick Henry and John Marshall and Henry Clay, uh, uh, Grover Cleveland. That was very interesting. This this book on uh, John Quincy Adams uh, just. Um, uh, amazingly good, I think. Uh, and I, I, it's about a 20, 25 minute drive for me to come from the house to here. So, uh, if Nathan's not with me, I put it on. And, uh, if Nathan's uh, with me, I don't know, it just depends on how boring he is that day on whether or not uh, I listen to the audio book, uh, or, <laughs> or listen to him. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. usually we talk. Um, Uh, sorry, Manny. I I just almost left you hanging out there, and uh, I I owe Manny a question. And uh, let's go ahead and get the music in here for our friend Manny, the the Padre of Old San Antonio. The Padre of Old San Antonio. Uh, does God call us Gentiles sinners? in the Bible? Well, most would say yes. I take a different view on it. Are you surprised? Uh, you know, most would take, and, and, and this is, the, the, let, me, let me say this in, in, a, in a clear way. Uh, the Bible does tell us that Gentiles have sinned. No doubt about it. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, And I think that in the context here, all is, it's it's not narrowed down to all of Israel. Uh, There's nothing in the context that would narrow it, narrow the Gentiles out of this. It is that all have sinned. However, does the Bible call us sinners? Let's uh, let's look here. I just um, pulled up at random First uh, Timothy chapter one verse nine, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. Uh, now, 
here, obviously here, the sinners right here are those under the law. That's the context of it. And so it would be interesting to follow this word sinner and see if it's always used in the context of a law of the law or not. Uh, maybe we can uh, uh, find it and uh, bring that about. I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat doubtful uh, that uh, we would be able to do that, but let's let's just pull up. Uh, all the sinners. Yeah, here's 47 times that you've got sinners. Now, let's let's uh, play with it just a moment here. All the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I suppose, you know, we would want to verify this, but all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the subject matter is Jews, not Gentiles, so we could mark those out. Then we come into... Uh, Romans, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, one, yeah, okay, here's Galatians. Let me jump to Galatians. Uh, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. So certainly, I think we could say the Bible calls Gentiles sinful. Now, why did I say sinful instead of sinner? I don't understand why all uh, all Bible translations have taken an adjective and made it a noun when it comes to this word. An adjective describes a noun, uh, uh, but sinner is a noun. You are a sinner. Now, this is a fine line, but I think there's an important distinction here that what the Bible does it, is this word sinner, when you look up these uh, 47 times, it's always, like here, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, it's an adjective, an adjective. An adjective describes somebody. So I would say, yeah, typically we would say uh, sinful. You know, Manny is sinful. Now, in logic, you might come through and say, well, if he's sinful, what do we call a person who is sinful? Okay, maybe we call them a sinner. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, if a person is a thief, we call them a thiever <laughs> or maybe a robber. Uh, and so if, if they're involved in robbery, they are a robber. So this might be why they went kind of, I think what is the step further and made it center. But I think that both for Jews and Gentiles, our identity is not that we are a sinner. Our identity is we're made in the image of God, that uh, we have an opportunity, a free will opportunity uh, in the image of God to choose good and evil, and, and often we chose evil. And uh, because of that, we have sin, and uh, we are sinful. I just, I, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable, and again, maybe somebody would set me straight on it, but I, I, I did a session on this, are we sinners or are we sinful, or somewhere along the way out there, I did a, I think it was just a one-time one session on it. Uh, are Gentiles sinful? Yes, and I think the, Bi the Bible does call them that, for example, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, by the way, listen to an evangelical on this, we who are Jews by nature. And, and it, it has to put we who are Jews as the Christians and the sinners, not sinners of the Gentiles as the non-Christians. And so it does a replacement theology there. I don't know why evangelicalism can't get that the Bible talks about Jews and they're real Jews. They're not the church. They're not, you know, it's, it's, uh, they, they have to do this as uh, saved or unsaved because they take an amillennial uh, point of view rather than a literal point of view. Jews by nature are Jews uh, who are, you know, born of Abraham. And, um, and a, a, a comparison was made. But every one of those uh, 47 times that you have sinners, it's going to be the adjective, not the noun. As far as I re recall, there is no noun for sinner. So does the Bible call Gentiles sinners? Not really. Does the Bible say that Gentiles are sinful? Yes. How's that for a 
persnickety answer. Um, Michael. I, I always seem to get to Michael last in the day or save him to the first. But but I am uh, not saving it today. We are taking it right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's get all aboard on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga down to the Cucamonga question for the day. And uh, we are going to uh, take uh, Michael's uh, question down in Rancho Cucamonga. And uh, the question, when Paul says to rightly divide, is he including his own epistles? I think so. Uh, You know, rightly divide the word of truth. Would he be saying that, you know, only rightly divide other words of truth? I think it's a hard argument to make. Uh, I think that Paul having had the experience of living in this transition, he writes some things that are of the kingdom gospel. He writes some things that are of the individual gospel. And these are the things especially that he wants you to rightly divide them from. I might go even farther to say he wants us to rightly divide all truth. Because it is interesting, he says, rightly divide the word of truth. Now, we always take that as the scripture. And and it could be, but there there is a um, a good way to to say scripture, you know, rightly divide the graphe, perhaps uh, graphe is normally translated as scriptures, but he says the word of truth. Now, is it is there any value in saying that? We've said a lot of times on various subjects, you and I, not together, but all through life, we have all said, uh, you know, there's a degree of truth to that. There's a degree of truth to that. That, in a sense, that's just rightly dividing truth. Uh, divide truth from from that which is false. Now, I don't think that's the heart of the meaning because in 2 Timothy 2.15, he's very much talking about the scriptures. And so I think it uh, brings it down to the scriptures. But is he, is he calling us to rightly divide his own, his own epistles? I think so. Uh, now, you know, the modern translations, I think, have done a malpractice on this, a translation malpractice. And they just said, uh, you know, accurately handle, uh, accurately handle the word of truth. Well, certainly that would argue for accurately handling Paul as well, we look at it in its more literal sense, rightly divide, because he literally told them to rightly divide. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't think you could build a, um, a good argument for not rightly dividing Paul. Now that said, again, most of my right dividing brothers are a little allergic to rightly dividing Paul. Uh, they don't like to rightly divide Paul. And I think they need to question their assumptions on that. This might be one of the benefits that I had in coming from evangelicalism into dispensationalism and fundamentalism into right dividing, uh, that I, uh, I am not quite as susceptible to the right dividing guild and the blinders that they put on, because all of us put on blinders. When I was a Southern Baptist, I had Southern Baptist blinders on. That was all I could see. Uh, and, and uh, you know, an evangelical and whatever it is. You, you put on these blinders. Jack Hiles had those blinders. Uh, and when you're like us and you, you sort of stumble into something and you don't know the politics and you don't know the, the background, then you, you kind of uh, learn things on your own and you, you see this differently. And so I think a lot of my right dividing brothers uh, want to take all Pauline literature as a homogenous unit, so to speak, all the same, all the same DNA to it, all the same audience. It's all about the mystery. And I think that that does not rightly divide Paul. And I think they fail in that. And I think because of that, they run into some uh, some problems. <laughs> Evan. Even I, I, I gotta, I gotta slow down and say this. 
Evan Illogicals. Evan Illogicals. Evan Illogicals. I like that. Uh, I saw a word the other day I should use. Uh, Sunday in, in studying uh, Second Peter, we were talking about the, the prefix dis, which is the opposite of you. And I think somewhere, uh, maybe in the sermon, I talked about dystopia and utopia. Uh, but I saw somebody used the term, and this was, this was old, old, so not, not even in modern context. They used the term dis, disangelicals, disangelicals. Uh, they got a bad message instead of a you angelical, a good message, the disangelicals. It's not bad. Evangelogicals, I like it. Evangelicals, I like it. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's all very good. Um, and... Um, I'm, I'm starting in the morning with Gerard's question in the kingdom of the Netherlands. Sorry about that. I missed that on uh, Worshipify, and uh, I will uh, get that. Uh, first thing out of the box tomorrow, we will uh, start uh, with Gerard in the Netherlands. And uh, tomorrow, we'll also be studying First John, so 10 a.m. in the morning uh, for... Uh, ask the theologian in the evening, First John, a regular full schedule all week. I'm going to go today and see if I can't finish up this book on evangelical garbage. Uh, we'll see how all that goes. Uh, but it's, uh, it's coming. The plane is landing. We got our seat belts buckled and our uh, uh, tray tables up. Our seat backs upright in their upright position. And uh, the uh, flight attendant is going around giving everybody dirty looks. It's time for you to put away that laptop. So we're getting close on uh, 